Hi, everybody. Welcome back to CDO IQ. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of the 18th annual event here, the, base, the gathering of chief data officers. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. I'm Dave Vellante with Sanjeev Mohan. Kabir Barde is here. He's the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of One Trust Security. Great to have you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. My first time at this yeah, event. Well, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. S Stephanie set us up. She's been on many, many times. <laughs> yeah. Great guest from, from days gone by. Helped us get theCUBE going back yes. in the big data days. And uh, wow, what a, what a run it's been. Uh, you guys have been around for what? Five years, roughly? Eight. No, a little more than that. Eight yeah. years. Okay. Yeah, why'd 2016. You, why'd you, 2016. Why'd you start the company? Yeah, so uh, data privacy was the big emerging trend. I worked at a cybersecurity company, actually, at the time. We had built a technology that monitors employees' phones, bring your own device monitoring technology. There are all sorts of unintended privacy consequences of trying to do good things to be helpful for our customers. And so kind of discovered this emerging set of privacy laws and rules and decided to start OneTrust, had a lot of help. And then the GDPR passed and things just exploded from there. And so we grew very quickly. I mean, we went from zero to 100 million AR in three years, which is like slow in today's world. I think <laughs> was did it in like 12 months. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did it in three years and uh, we are at about 14,000 customers today, about 500 million ARR, about 2,000 employees around the world. And we've expanded from privacy to responsible use of data in AI. How do you collect data transparently, automate all the compliance obligations, and then enforce the policies when you're using the data? So, first of all, congratulations, amazing. It's, it's interesting, at RSA a year ago, you know, the, the talk was how the bad guys were going to use LLMs to yeah. write better phishing emails. Yeah. And of course, this year, everybody was talking about, which is your wheelhouse, was how do you secure yeah. the AI? Yeah. And that's really what you do. Yeah. So uh, I, it was kind of interesting to see that shift. Did you see it as well? I mean, did you hear how everybody was talking about securing AI? So, whereas a so year it's ago, interesting. It so, in, so in my role, I, get, I go to a lot of these conferences, I meet with a lot of these customers. And so the, what's unique is I've seen this from RSA, the security point of view. I went to an ethics conference and saw this from the chief ethics officer point of view. Went to IAPP and saw this from a privacy point of view. Now the data point of view. Even from a sustainability and ESG point of view. The f it's the first time in my career that I can go to any single one of these conferences and the keynote is the same and all the sessions are the same. And it's how do we responsibly use data in AI. What's complicated is every single persona is looking at it just from their angle. So you go to RSA, they see AI as a security problem. You go to an ethics conference, they see it as an ethical problem about fairness and bias. You go to a privacy problem, they're like, no, this is a privacy GDPR problem. The reality is it's all of We go to the, a data conference, it's a data it's problem. It's a data right? governance <laughs> problem, it's a quality problem, it's a lineage yeah. problem. And so you have all these people approaching it from different angles mm -hmm. and there's got to be something that brings that together. And that's what we're focused on, is thinking about what really does this look like as all these teams start working together and the number one thing we're starting to see companies do is starting to form an AI governance committee with all these stakeholders at the table. And then they're starting to say, okay, what people, process, and tools do we need to go build a new architecture of responsible use? So the dynamics, let's talk about the dynamics in, the, in, yeah. your, in your business. It's a, it's a highly crowded market. It's getting more crowded. Startups coming in every day. Yeah. We're seeing some, some M&A, quite a bit, actually. Yeah. We hear big news this week is Wiz getting acquired by Google for some huge number. We'll see yeah. if that actually happens. Uh, but it seems like the funding's not stopping. Yeah. Uh, the, the new startups and the innovations, you're seeing edge security, you're seeing AI security, yeah. all kinds of specialization. How do you think about the dynamics of your industry and where do you guys fit? Yeah, look, I mean, as, as, a, um, as a founder of a company, you always want to be wary of empty restaurant syndrome. <laughs> like if there's, if there's nobody eating next to you, yeah. then you're probably at the wrong restaurant. And so, I think a fiercely competitive and a, and a crowded market is a good thing if you have an opportunity to be the outlier number one. You don't want to be in the middle of a pack of a crowded market. So I think there's a lot of goodness in what we're seeing. The other good signal is in enterprise software, you never have a big enough market until Microsoft, Salesforce, some of these giants are in your market. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to see I mean, it didn't go through, but Salesforce look at Informatica, like data management, data security. They're looking at all these different things. Microsoft is here at this conference thinking about purview and all these different things. So the market is good and the market is ripe. And in enterprise software, it's been a bloodbath except for two categories, AI and security. And we're at the epicenter of the combination of that market. So I think it's very exciting. Now the thing is, how do you differentiate and stand out? 
And what we have seen is you kind of can segment the market in data security and then everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting about the responsible AI problem is that the everything else problem as even bigger of a problem than data security, right? Like data at rest, data access controls, yeah, like these things have been around yeah, forever. Yeah. The new challenges that are complicating this are, do I have permission? Do I have purpose specification? Do I have the right compliance controls? Am I enforcing minimization? Am I enforcing pseudonymization? These are things that are, that are way more interesting and way more unsolved and create an opportunity to really have a brand that's differentiated and not blended in with the security companies. And so that's been our strategy is really calling that responsible use of data, intentionally not data security, um, and playing nicely in that ecosystem rather than competing with data security companies. Interesting, yeah. uh, um, but you're still you know, generally in that space. I, I would call, yeah, uh, I think in a category, the public markets would see us as a cybersecurity and an AI company. Which is, which is actually a really good thing. <laughs> right? If we get the whiz <laughs> multiples. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was funny, I was listening to Peter Thiel the other day from yeah. a couple of weeks ago at the Aspen Institute, and, he, and typical VCs is, well, you want to be a monopoly. You know, <laughs> yeah. you and there is no monopoly in your space. Right. Which is, in, in a way, I would say as an entrepreneur, that's a, that's a good thing, unless you can be the, the monopoly. And I, mean, I don't know, Microsoft is maybe the biggest, and it's hard to tell how big they are because they're big at everything. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I think you know, maybe Palo Alto is, is the next biggest, yeah. but it's you yeah. know, very, very small slice of the, the, the yeah. market. And the market's enormous. Because yeah. as you said, it's data security, it's like everything else. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's almost a, a measure of 100 billion yeah. plus. Yeah. Right? So what are you doing here? Yeah, so um, what we're finding is that the requirements on privacy, consent, compliance, third-party management, all these things used to be kind of legal disciplines and compliance disciplines that would just sit in a corner in Back a, in a GC organization. Yeah. Now the risks of AI, what we talked about, there, there, there is no machine learning. Once you put data into the machine learning algorithm, you really can't take it out. And we talked about there's now been five algorithmic and data deletion orders issued to companies with five-year bans. So companies are seeing that one wrong mistake of data put into the machine learning algorithm contaminates the entire thing and creates a dramatic competition risk, a dramatic uh, trust risk, brand reputation risk, and enforcement risk. And so companies are now saying, okay, this privacy, third-party risk, like th these new types of issues can't be standalone. They actually have to be architected as part of my data architecture. For example, if I'm collecting data with the right permissions and consent, we're number one in the world in consented preference management, that signal can't live in a legal tool. That signal has to be metadata embedded in my CDP, embedded in my Snowflake and my Databricks architecture. And then when I access that data through my data catalog, I need to check for not just sensitivity and user, but I need to check for the third dimension now, which is purpose. Do I have purpose and permission for that use case? Based on that purpose and permission for that use case, have I orchestrated the right policies to enforce on that data so that my data user isn't having to like write a calendar reminder to delete the data manually in three, you know, in three months, whatever it is? How do we enforce that? So what we're seeing is this kind of traditional world of risk management is actually being merged into the data architecture. Hmm. And so that's why we're here to, to um, to learn more about that so, with the chief data officer. So when uh, beginning of this year, I wrote my uh, predictions document, like yeah. all good analysts do is to write about predictions. Yeah. So I had four predictions for AI. And three of them have come true, but one of them I feel is still struggling. So the it, the first one was by the uh, platform, like unification of yeah. structured, unstructured. The second one was personalizing of AI through yep. RAG, vector databases, yep. fine tuning. The third one was on AI agents. Yep. The fourth one that I, I, I'm hearing from my customers is struggling is AI governance. Yeah. And, the, and when I ask them why is this struggling, so they tell me two reasons. One is that they don't even know what use cases to put the AI to use. So they're like, till we get the act together, yeah. 
AI governance seems to be putting yeah. the cart before the horse. But the second problem they're saying is that we don't know what AI governance means. Right. Is it governing the models and what data goes uh, into it and right. trains, or is it the usage? Yeah. Or so, how do you define data yeah. AI governance? Where does data governance and AI governance begin? I, I love the question, and these are these are such overlapping concepts. Um, but different enough that organizations are thinking about an AI governance program and technology different than data governance, technology, and tooling. When we talk to companies about their AI governance program, they're really starting in, I would say, one of three areas, very like blocking and tackling. Hmm. The first is consent management. Okay. To, to, ma to govern AI, fundamentally, you need to make sure the data you're putting into that AI has the right permissions and purpose but specified. How do, you, how do you know what OpenAI has done? They don't publish, they don't tell you. Well, this is for your proprietary oh, first proprietary. party data. Okay, so what's happening is, well, first yeah. of all, OpenAI is built on third party data. Third party yes. data is dead. So that dif di uh, first differentiation using third party data is hmm. dead. Second, your ability to use third party data your one FTC <laughs> ruling away from that yes. no longer being. It's teetering, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even in the corporate America, like death of third party cookies, yes. privacy laws yeah. make it impossible for consent to move between third parties because it's not possible to be clear to the first party who the third parties are. So companies are all moving to first party data strategies and differentiation is not who trained the most public data on their LLM, it's who has the most proprietary hmm. first party data. That proprietary first party data has to be collected with permission and purpose and the right retention and minimization. So that's the first thing we're seeing companies build in this foundation. Hmm. That's because that not only helps you with your AI governance, but also helps you with personalization initiatives, non-AI yes, data-driven correct. projects. You need yeah. that for too. That's really the bridge. The second thing, that's for kind of in-house data that you're using to train your algorithms. The second, third-party management. Third-party management, a lot of times when we start conversations with companies about AI governance, they lead to third-party management discussions because a majority of a company's AI risk in practice is from your software supply chain. Hmm. I mean, this is all shadow IT that's going through your technology vendors to all your business users. Salesforce, everyone else just upgraded their application with their co-pilot, and it just came. <laughs> it yeah. just came. Right, like the cloud, you just get version updates. All of a sudden, your users are typing data into these tools. So, number one, you ask a company, do you know which, which third parties? Even search. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Like, just ask a company yeah. which third parties are using AI models and mm. what data are your users putting into it? Crickets. And that's a massive exposure, right? And the regulations in AI that are emerging put the responsibility both on the deployer and the provider. So you can't just blame Salesforce for doing that. You're responsible for having your arms around this. Hmm. And so third-party management is a really important area. And then we've developed a dedicated AI governance capability. Um, there are really two different camps of, of dedicated AI governance. So the surveys show that AI governance as a discipline, 50% of that is actually run by privacy programs. 50% hmm. of that is run not by privacy programs, but maybe a data engineer or a security program or a, a data governance professional. So we're seeing companies that have already built a pretty robust privacy infrastructure of assessments, of mapping your data, just add AI as a new domain, set of questions. Set Regulated of companies typically or not necessarily? Uh, we, we actually see the majority of our demand comes from what I'd call non-traditionally regulated industries. Because oh, really? yeah. look, tra yeah, kinda, traditional yeah. regulated industries have had data governance teams, some process they got for nailed. years, they've yeah. got it, something do, gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now privacy and AI regulation changes the definition of a regulated industry because data is regulated, every industry is regulated. So there's this massive tail, greenfield of 80, 90% of the market that has never been served that are looking to do things. And these are a lot of technology vendors, airlines, um, uh, even um, like CPG. We're seeing a lot of these types of brands. A lot of B2C companies that have that direct interface with the consumer hmm. because that interface is their superpower to collect data. And so you have to protect that trust at all costs. Is there more AI adoption in regulated industries or unregulated? Uh, I don't know the stats on this. Right. I mean, what, what we're seeing across the board is that these use cases move in waves. So hmm. you see 
Like um, right now we're seeing just a massive wave of transportation, airlines, CPG, pharma, consumer goods. Um, we're seeing a lot of entertainment brands, sports, um, trying to drive like these brands that have big personalization initiatives that are now being AI powered personalization initiatives that are trying to differentiate, that are trying to get better ROI from their marketing spend, reach more users. Those are the use cases that we're seeing drive the most excitement. Which is interesting because a lot of the industries you mentioned yeah. are actually not regulated. Exactly, yeah. So, which means the regulated uh, industries are kind of saying, you know, because we've been regulated, so we were mandated to manage our data and they don't need as much help. I, I'm just... I think it's a maturity curve, right? right. All of these, yeah. any kind of risk-driven market, it's hard to look at size of company. Uh, it's easier, it's, it's more practical to look at maturity of yeah. their governance program. Right. And I think you're right, the traditional government, healthcare, yes. um, yeah. these, these types of services. financial services, thank you, these types of organizations um, have a higher maturity. maturity. Correct. And so they've yeah. been doing these things for years. Right. Maybe they're using legacy technologies. Correct. They have more, pro they have Machine three lines learning. of defense. Yeah. Like, yes. yeah. So um, yeah. there's certainly opportunity there and we see a lot of oh, opportunity, of course. Of course. but the opportunity shapes differently than in the 80% of the market that right. is seeing this for the first time. Yeah. So these, uh, the executive orders, these, these regulations, the, the yeah. five, that's a tailwind, obviously, for, for, yeah, for so one Yeah, so the trust. five are enforcement actions that have come today in AI have been from the FTC Section 5, which gives the FTC generic power to enforce unfair and deceptive business practices. <laughs> which basically means that they can bring you to court or Yeah, or if it's unfair or deceptive, right? And, you, yeah. If you say you it's, do something and you don't do it, that's unfair or deceptive. Okay, it's classic Lena Khan, and I could rant on that. But you you <laughs> yeah. love it, so it's it's great for you. But but look, we, well, for, we don't have I don't have a position on it, right? No, like, but it certainly helps your business, right? I mean, all this complexity and need to 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 remediate. Complexity requires technology and automation to yeah, tackle. for I sure. Think that's true, I want to I yeah. want to remediate that risk or reduce that risk. Now, here's my yeah. question: A lot of times, when when these enforcement actions or executive orders or regulations are put forth, what, what's happening in Europe and obviously gets adopted oftentimes in the United States, a lot of times the large companies, yes, it make, gives them a huge advantage because the small guys don't have the resources to deal with that complexity. Can you help companies across the board or is this really just a big company thing? Um, so we, we have 14,000 customers, about 1,200 of those are kind of enterprise global 2,000, 80, mm -hmm. 80 of the Fortune okay. 100. The other 11,000 are Joe's Bait Shop to the SMB. Be um, Belize Cement Company <laughs> yeah. to the Funeral Home Private Equity. It's, it's all across the map. So what, what's really interesting um, about this market is when you look at it from, um, when you look at the regulatory drivers, you mentioned that the big companies kind of are either advantaged or disadvantaged in this. Um, the reality is we're seeing the big companies lobbying for more yes, regulation. Yes, because they're advantaged. They can they can, they yeah, can use they it as can, a moat correct. and a blocker for well, the well, yeah, the, big for companies, the disruptors. The big companies are multinationals. They already have to comply with all this stuff in Europe. So if these smaller companies that are U.S. only don't have to comply with those, then the big companies are actually at a disadvantage in some areas. For a period of time. For a period of time. Yeah. But you're seeing more big companies lobby for. The difference is what level of prescriptiveness do which companies want in these regulations? There's some. Uh, schools of thought that we want this to be very prescriptive because companies just want to be told what to do. They're going to do it. That's the compliance culture in America. And it's fine. That's what Zuck wants. So, yeah, but other companies right. are kind of at the train of thought, which is we're on the bleeding edge. No regulator is going to understand this. And the biggest risk of AI is not these privacy and security things. The biggest risk of AI is not using AI because AI is going to cure cancer, save lives, solve safety applications, democratize access to education. Make better defense, right? so all these things. You have these, you have these, which is why I say we don't have an opinion on regulation, so to speak, because there are different motivations and different issues. Whether there's a federal privacy law or 50 different state laws, it's going to be hard no matter what. Actually, it's easier for us to build technology if there's one law, so. 
it's a it's a it's a complicated what, web of, of issues. What, yeah. what I, I love about compliance, like large companies yeah. want compliance. Sam Altman goes to the Congress. Yeah, he wants and, the, and he wants yeah, regulation. You want it. You want because it. he because wants he that wants regulatory capture. Out, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He wants to cut out the small players. <laughs> Elon's then, behind. He said no. He doesn't yeah, want that. Yes, but then he goes to Europe and they say we're going to regulate you, and he says, okay, then I'm cutting you off. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> the de- the devil's <laughs> in the details yeah. on yeah. regulate what and how. <laughs> Correct. And and, yes, um, yeah. and yeah, exactly. But the takeaway is yeah. that we're getting, you know, more regulations or enforcement actions around privacy. And, and that is something that's the, the core. Of that's what core of what we do. do. Yeah. yeah. Risk compliance, collect data in a compliant way, manage your compliance and risk programs, and then use data in a compliant way. That's the core core of what yeah. we do. Well, listen. Thanks so much for. And you're speaking here at the conference. Is that right, right after or? this? Oh, yeah. What do you? What? What? Give us. Did, did you just summarize your talk? Yeah. Responsible you know, use of data and AI. <laughs> I mean, there's this, this is a new <laughs> architecture that's being Fantastic. built. Fantastic. Love it. Kabir, yeah, thanks amazing. so much Thank for coming so on theCUBE. Thank you. Really. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Thank Chief. Yeah, Great yeah, to see you, man. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. Yeah. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Sanjeev Mohan, Dave Vellante. We're back right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE's coverage. CDO IQ from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right back. <laughs>